A very good morning to everyone. On behalf of Great Place to Work Institute India, I, Neha Sethi, extend a very warm welcome to all of you. At Great Place to Work, it's always been our endeavor, you know, to bring out learnings from some of the best workplaces and basis those learnings, create sharing forums like these. Also, as most of you would already know, Great Place has been studying diverse set of organizations for the last three decades. And I'm really happy to share that in India, we actually completed 11 years just this week. It was just actually day before yesterday that we celebrated our 11 years in the country. Yeah. So today through this webinar, we are really delighted to present to you the inspiring journey of Marico. I'm sure Marico as an organization is one whose brands most of you would have used. So the question ahead of us today is, what has helped Marico in creating the high trust, high performance culture and how it continues to really sustain them? Yeah. To share this journey, we have with us today, Shruti Ambegaukar. Shruti heads the organization development and governance at Marico. Shruti has over two decades of experience in the corporate world across consulting and internal HR. Just talking about the structure of this webinar today. So Shruti will uh, lead the discussion. She's going to take about 30 plus minutes. So the first half of our webinar really to take us through the enriching journey of Marico as an organization. Uh, post she's taken us uh, through the journey, we're going to open the floor for question and answers. Uh, do feel free though to enter your questions using the Q&A tab as and when they occur to you. And then we'll pick up those questions towards the later part of the webinar. Yeah, so over to you, Shruti. Uh, thank you, Neha, and good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the uh, to Great Place to Work Institute for the opportunity to share how we at Marico endeavor to make Marico a great place to work. To start with, maybe I'll just give you a quick overview about the organization. We are a relatively young company, 27 years, uh, almost 28 now, but 27 plus years in operation. And we are in one of India's leading consumer products company. Primarily, we operate in the beauty and wellness space. We, our turnover is about 6,000 crores and our market capitalization is about 6.5 billion. Our aspiration is to be an emerging markets multinational company uh, with a leadership position in the core segments that we operate in, which is what we call nourishment and grooming in the chosen markets of Asia and Africa. I do hope many of you who have joined the webinar today use some of our products, be it Parachute, Nehar, Livon, Hair and Care, Silk and Shine, Setwear, Medical, or Sephora. The one thing that guides Marico and its employees is, is our purpose. We believe that the purpose of a great company is its reason for being. For us, it defines our existence and the way we contribute to society. Our purpose is to transform in a sustainable manner the lives of those we touch by nurturing and empowering them to maximize their true potential. Simply put, our aspiration and our endeavor is to make a difference to the lives of all the stakeholders that we touch, whether it's our consumers, our shareholders, business associates, or our employees or members. This purpose and our underlying set of values and beliefs establish the way in which we at Marico operate. I'd like to share with you uh, maybe a little bit about those values and beliefs because to me, who uh, I've been with the organization for almost seven years now, um, I think they've been a foundation of what we have done and how we have gone about building the culture of the organization. And the first one is that we genuinely believe that great culture builds great organizations and not really the other way around. And this belief has started with our founder, which is 
Harsh Mariwala. So Harsh himself is a very strong believer of this statement. Um, and, you know, right from inception, uh, when the organization was formed in 1990, there has been a very conscious effort on part of the leaders of the organization to make values and culture a core pivot in the way Marico has been grouped. And uh, there's a very interesting story about that as well. Um, the entire story actually anchors around one of our core beliefs, which is involvement builds commitment. Um, so Harsh, uh, and Mar Harsh formed Marico in 1990. Um, and uh, it was actually part of a company, which a family run business, uh, which was run by the Mariwala family, which was called Bombay Oil. Uh, and Marico was the consumer products business of Bombay Oil was moved out and uh, Marico was formed. Um, Harsh always had a vision of creating a professionally managed organization. And while quite a few employees from Bombay Oil moved into Marico, uh, at that time we also hired a lot of professional leaders uh, to join Marico because we wanted to build a certain culture, set a certain tone uh, for the organization. And then all these leaders came together from different organizations. They all came with their value sets, their belief systems, uh, their experiences. Um, and that made Harsh realize that while all of that is extremely valuable, uh, we still needed to define a Marico way of doing things. Now, as a conventional entrepreneur in the 1990s, he could have very well said, look, this is my dream. And uh, you know, this is what I believe should be the culture of Marico. Uh, but that's not what he did. Uh, he put down his points and his thoughts in terms of what he thought should be Marico's culture, and he shared it with the leadership team. Uh, he invited their critique, their inputs, their perspectives, and together this group, this group formed the first values of Marico, which were called 3P, which is people, products, and profits. So this itself, this entire process, which was the beginning of uh, the culture building process of Marico, was laid on the foundation that involvement builds commitment. This group of people were the one who created the first set of values and hence they demonstrated a high degree of ownership in transcending those values and the practices linked to values within the organization. We see and we experience this, uh, this, this value system in the organization even today. Um, Alignment conversations is something that happens very often in Marico because our belief is that if there's a stakeholder who needs to be involved when a particular idea or a problem be, is being solved, uh, you know, we should reach out to them uh, and a value of boundarylessness guides that piece. Um, even when we look at a performance management system by design, we have a concept of shared goals where people, whether it's two people or a group of people or a community of people can actually share goals so that together they're working for a common cause. The second belief, which is very important for us um, is the way we treat our employees or rather members. In Marco, in fact, we don't call them employees, we call them members. Because our belief is that membership trumps employeeship. Think about it, you know, when you're a member of a society or an organization or a unit, um, do you feel a high sense of ownership? Do you feel that you have an equal stay in what the, what the community or that particular society stands for? Um, and that's actually the principle with which we call our employees members. So our offer to them is not to just come to Marico for a job, but actually it's an invitation to determine and to participate in Marico's growth story. Uh, the thing about membership is also that it also puts the onus of participation, not just on the organization, which of course is a very important role to play in creating an environment conducive for working, but it also puts the onus on members um, to bring in their best, to contribute uh, to the best of their capabilities so that they are able to uh, contribute to the growth story of the organization. Transparency and openness, I would say, is another part of Marico's uh, uh, culture. Uh, it was something that was articulated when we articulated our first set of values, which was three Ps. And we believe this is absolutely essential to create a trust-based work culture, which is what Marico stands for. Um, and some manifestations of that, while we see today, even started when the organization was formed. 
for example today open offices are passe you know all of us work in open office offices but that wasn't really the case in 1990 when the organization was born so our first office in 1990 had was an open office it had cubicles it had you know glass doors everywhere harsh himself used to uh, sit in a glass cabin yeah uh we started the culture of addressing everybody on first name basis including the founder again something which is passe today but not necessarily something that was visible in many organizations in 1990 um open house or town halls which are again a very common practice today started in mariko right at the time of inception clearly with the objective where members could come forward and ask questions share their concerns and seek answers uh, from the leaders of the organization a performance management system is also uh, an embodiment of this value because uh, you know the goals that are set for any member in the organization are publicly visible in fact as a practice the leadership team always shares their goals with their team and that sets the tone of how the rest of the organization goes about goal setting um the one thing that i've personally uh, admired about mariko having been part of the organization is our 360 degree feedback process um, i'd say that it's a signature process for us every new leader in mariko whether it's a leader who's promoted or a leader who joins mariko at the leadership level goes through a very detailed 360 degree feedback process uh, after the first year at mariko and unlike many organizations where the process is run through a survey for us it's actually a conversation that happens with the leader so it's a facilitated conversation where that particular leader's feedback sources so it could be 5 10 15 they all come together in a group um to give uh, direct feedback to the le uh, leader and i don't think uh, there is any other uh, strong embodiment of the value of transparency and openness than probably a practice like this and we are able to do this because we we have had this belief right from the beginning and it has created a trust based work culture for us mutual trust and respect is another pillar for us as an at an uh, organization level and also contributes to creating our trust within the organization um uh, some examples of this is for example in um in our offices in mariko uh, we don't really have uh, uh, time attendance recording or time recording um so Uh, right from uh, for many years now we've believed in the concept of flexi timing we've believed in the concept that we trust our people and uh, people can come in and go as they wish as long as they are able to deliver on their uh, work commitments um we also have a unique contingency leave policy uh, again uh, on the principle of trust uh, so if people need to take time off they can take time off uh, they can take two day up to two days off any number of times in the year all they need to do is they just need to inform their supervisor so that the rest of the work commitments are taken care of uh, per se there is no limit on contingency leave again comes from the belief that if you need it you will take it if you don't need it you won't take it um i think third shining example for us is we also have a, a self authorized ex, uh, expense policy so uh, which we uh, you know in our offices where if you if you make an expense you just submit with the bills there is no approval required and the expense claims pass through so these are some of the examples of how we demonstrate trust uh, within the organization so these have been the anchor pillars for us uh, to build our culture to and these have been embodied in our values uh we have three uh, we've articulated uh, our values three times over we started with what a 3p which was people products and profit when we became a publicly listed company in 96 we realized that the business context had changed for us and hence we reviewed our values and amplified the elements that made a lot more sense so we realized that uh, just making good products wasn't uh, wasn't sufficient it was important now to start understanding the needs of the consumers so uh, the co in come in actually stood for consumers people um, took on the role of membership and i've already talked about membership earlier and uh, uh, profits took on uh, the role of wealth because now we were a public listed company and the focus was also to create wealth for the investors that had invested in the business 
We also realized that there were two new values that we needed to embrace uh, to achieve our business results, and that were excellence and innovation. And so the E and I N incumbent actually stood for each of those values. 2006, we again reviewed our values because in 2005, our business had reached a particular milestone. The entire uh, portfolio, business portfolio had changed. And we realized that to operate in a new business context, we again needed to review our values. So we did retain some of the ethos of the values from the first two sets, so consumer-centric, transparency and openness, uh, excellence, innovation, uh, even boundarylessness, which were aspects of collaboration, is something that we retained. Uh, we realized that there were two new values that we needed to embrace. One was bias for action, because speed to action was, uh, speed to market was an important aspect. And another one was global outlook, uh, which actually uh, channelized Marico's foray into the international markets and helped us achieve the international footprint that we have today. So as an organization, the core, while the values articulation has changed over the years, the core of our culture has not really changed since 1991. We have shaped and reshaped our values in line with what we thought was sound for business. Um, and with the examples, hopefully I have shared that our value statements are not just ideal statements, just something to put on the wall, but we do endeavor to live them on a daily basis through our practices, policies and programs. And all of these have been the cornerstone of Marco's culture building process. I'd like now, uh, to share with you now, um, in terms of while we have a strong culture, what is it that we do for our employees? And that is manifested in our talent value proposition. Another core experience, um, and this is, uh, you know, this is something that we consistently get feedback from on when we do inciting conversations within the organization is anybody who works at Marico experiences empowerment. And that's, that's another core belief for us. Uh, we are a very flat uh, structured organization and we believe that the lean structure provides for greater autonomy to take decisions. Uh, you know, it enables action to happen at the front line while keeping people accountable for what they're supposed to deliver. And this is a very strong sense and an ethos that we preserve. So our roles are very, very large with a lot of elbow room. And we really expect any incumbent who comes into the role actually brings in you know, his or her flavor so that is able to expand the role and take the role to another level. So empowerment is a core uh, cultural element as well uh, from an organization perspective. Early responsibility is another thing that we believe. Uh, we believe that capability and competence are more important than qualification and experience. Um, we believe that early responsibility stretches and challenges members. It enriches their learning and actually accelerates their growth. And uh, hence, our endeavor always is to uh, maybe put young people in big jobs. Of course, we will provide them the necessary support that's required for them to succeed. Uh, but early responsibility is also one of the key elements of our value proposition. The third one is entrepreneur. And I guess this comes from our... Uh, from our genesis of being a founder-oriented company. Uh, by entrepreneurial, what I mean is, uh, as an organization, we do encourage risk-taking, experimentation. In fact, at one point in time, our, uh, uh, our tagline was uncommon sense, and that's something that we believe as an organization, because we want young people to try and do new things. That's how we will be able to grow the organization. And um, I think one of the shining examples of Marico's entrepreneurial culture is the formation of Kaya, which formed when Marico, it was part of Marico, and it set up an incubation cell. Uh, and the incubation cell was actually mandated to look for new business opportunities. And through the environmental scanning, uh, we found, uh, you know, we narrowed on an opportunity uh, because of which today we have Kaya, which is a separate company. We have similar such incubation uh, opportunities that we are currently pursuing uh, within the organization as well. And hopefully, uh, you know, a few years down the line, we'll have a new story to tell. So all of this, actually, the aspects of empowerment, early responsibility, entrepreneurial spirit are all embodied in our talent value proposition, which is a 
to continuously challenge, enrich, and fulfill the aspirations of Mariconians so that they can maximize their true potential to make a difference. Um, and interestingly, you know, the way this talent value proposition was also articulated was uh, it was not like a bunch of people sat in a room and said, okay, these are the nice words and hence we should put them. We actually adopted a consumer inciting approach. We spoke to people who were part of the organization who had worked with Marico either as employees or as you know, summer trainees, management trainees, to really understand what is it that they experience in the organization when they work at Marico. And the words that consistently came out were the words of challenge, enrich, and fulfill. And hence we said, okay, if that's what we're delivering, then that's what we should promise people. And hence this has become part of our talent value proposition. We obviously have many platforms and processes and programs and experiences for members to experience this talent value proposition. Um, I'll talk about uh, four of them, uh, that's there. Uh, the first one, which is a signature and an anchor process for us is what we call the PDP or the personal development planning process. Um, this is a process through which it's a member forward process, which means this is the process for the members. Uh, the members get to share what their career aspirations are through this process. They get to reflect on how the year has gone by for them. They get to share what is it that they have found challenging, enriching and fulfilling over the over the year that they have worked. Um, and all of these inputs actually uh, become a uh, basis for decisions that we take on, uh, you know, capability building, career movements, uh, you know, potential, uh, and uh, of course, remuneration as well. Uh, the core aspect of this process is the conversation that happens between the member and the supervisor, where the endeavors to really understand what are the drivers for the member? What will, what will be the fulfilling experiences for the member? iLearn is one of our recent initiatives. So as an organization, of course, like every organization, we do training uh, and you know, development happens through various things. But iLearn, uh, as a journey, we started our journey with e-learning through iLearn and now we are expanding that to ensure all kinds of learning interventions happen through iLearn. Uh, iLearn is a self-placed learning opportunity. And again, the name has been very carefully chosen. Uh, it says iLearn. So again, the accountability ownership is sitting with the member. The member is empowered to choose what he or she wants to learn. Um, so that's one of the ways that we provide learning experiences uh, to our members. Uh, Young Board is, uh, is something that we started three years ago. In fact, the third Young Board is just completing their tenure for us. Young Board constitutes of about eight to 10 members from different functions who get promoted to the leadership band within the organization. And the mandate to this Young Board is to pursue some big pet ideas for the organization uh, or to take on initiatives which build the culture, which build the culture of the organization. Um, the the it also provides an accelerated learning opportunity for the young board members because for the first time when they become young board members they no longer just look at things from a functional perspective but start looking at things from a broader business or an organization perspective uh, growth hacking teams are another uh, uh, another venture that we launched about a year year and a half ago the idea of growth hacking teams is for small groups to come together to pursue certain growth opportunities, again, with the objective of, uh, you know, accelerating learning as well as uh, it leading to business benefits and bringing a cross functional group of people together. Uh, the, you know, how we staff the young board members, how we staff growth hacking teams and we're prototyping uh, one more thing, which is actually sending uh, our uh, some of our team members deputing them to other organizations to learn new skills like digital or, you know, new businesses, which Marico is interested in and bring back those learnings within the organization. And PDP actually forms the basis for a lot of these decisions because the sharing and the expression of member aspirations happens during the PDP. I'd now like to talk about what else we do to actually make sure that Marico continues to be a relevant workplace for the future. And over the last few years, we've taken some specific initiatives around that. 
also realizing that close to 50% of our workforce is now millennials. So we need to you know, do things differently so that it also connects with the millennials that are working with us. Um, Innovation Jam is, uh, is something that we launched uh, four years ago. Uh, the idea of Innovation Jam is actually to crowdsource ideas because you know we believe that a great idea can sit with anyone within the organization so uh, we run in we run one innovation jam a year typically uh, it's based on a particular theme and members are invited to share their ideas uh, during a particular tenure when the innovation jam is live and the winning ideas obviously get implemented within the organization and the people who share the winning ideas also get handsomely rewarded for the ideas that they've shared some of the other things that we've done is we, we have a social recognition program, which is called Maricognize. And uh, uh, the reason we say social recognition is because through this program, uh, you know, you can recognize your team members, you can recognize peers, you can recognize people from different functions. And, and all of this happens on our social network platform, which is uh, Workplace by Facebook. Uh, there are combinations of uh, citations or monetary awards that are that are available for people to give up. Uh, this also creates a lot of visibility for people uh, who get recognized through Maricognize. Like most organizations, we've also done things for uh, the women in our workplace. Um, so while the mandate now is 26 weeks, and we of course have that, uh, even before that, we used to provide 17 weeks of maternity leave, which was higher than what was the law required. Um, and I'm really delighted to say that our uh, success rate of women returning from maternity leave is almost 98%. And we've had that for the last two or three years. Um, so I think we've figured out how to make the transitions happen successfully. And consciously, we're working towards uh, you know, making that happen. Um, and it's not just women. We also have uh, paternity leave. Uh, we have 15 days of paternity leave. And both men and women, uh, you know, do get something what we call a wellness package, which is uh, to help them uh, transition to this role of becoming new parents. We also provide them, um, you know, some uh, support in, in, so that they are able to either access uh, some wellness options uh, so that they're able to transition through this. Uh, Bottoms Up, uh, aptly named, is our reverse mentoring uh, program. And um, we started actually this with our top team, where our management trainees uh, mentored our top team, particularly on new age technologies, uh, digital, social media. So these, this is what we started. So that, and the advantage of bottoms up is um, the senior people within the organization get to learn new skills, and the younger people in the organization are able to learn from the experiences of the senior. Uh, and we've got really, really good feedback for this particular in intervention. Two of our newest initiatives uh, are My Day and Con Disconnect to Connect. These have been primarily launched to uh, you know, bring in more mindfulness in the way we do things and uh, the way we work. So My Day, we typically have it as the first Friday of the month. Uh, and on that day, uh, what we encourage people is basically to spend and focus time on themselves. Uh, and not really spend time in meetings and discussions, but really do their own work. Uh, disconnect to connect is uh, our endeavor to ensure that, uh, you know, when people are in meetings together, they're not distracted by cell phones, uh, but they're distracted, uh, but they're focused on the conversation that's happening. And, you know, so the meetings actually uh, achieve the purpose for which we have uh, had the meeting. We've also adopted some new age practices and tools to connect and communicate. I talked about Workplace uh, by Facebook. We were some one of the early adopters uh, of, the, of the organization uh, uh, of Facebook. And um, I think uh, that kind of grew like wildfire. So our plan was to prototype it with two, uh, two businesses and two functions. And you know everybody across the organization immediately took this on. And that's, uh, it's one of our very live uh, live uh, you know, uh, communication channels that's available where people post things on their own. Uh, FaceTime with Shogata is our initiative where uh, people get to interact with Shogata, who's our CEO directly. So this happens two or three times a year. 
uh, where he does a 20 minute presentation and the rest of the time is spent in Q&A where he answers all the questions live. Um, Amber is also one of our new joinees. Uh, she is uh, a bot and uh, you know, she is uh, positioned as Shogata's digital assistant and she currently listens to and talks to all the new joinees who join Marigo to understand what are their onboarding experiences so that if we are if we, we have to do something different or better, we are able to uh, do that. Uh, Workplace is also a platform which gets used to celebrate uh, and share things. So whether it's new product launches, whether it's acquisitions, whether it's individual recognitions or organization recognitions or fun events, we do all of that. Member wellness is another important area for us um, and we work towards providing well-being uh, on, uh, for our members in the area of health, uh, emotional wellness and uh, financial wellness and also provide opportunities for community wellness. Um, some of the newer things that we've experimented with over the last year is uh, uh, we have our own version of yoga by the bay, which is called yoga by the desk. And every Thursday we have a yoga instructor who comes into office and she does uh, like a 20 minute routine, uh, which I find it, uh, our employees find it extremely energizing. Uh, so much so that uh, it's something that, we, so we've taken a break right now and everybody's just waiting, saying, hey, when you guys starting the yoga by the desk initiator. We've also experimented with a corporate spa, both for men and women, and that's also been very well appreciated, again, to provide some relaxation and relief to our members during work hours. We do on-site and off-site health checkups, and we also uh, participate in uh, various marathons. Um, and a lot of it is courtesy Sephola because Sephola also is about uh, you know, staying active. Um, our emotional wellness program is anchored with uh, one to one health.net uh, uh, and we provide counseling support to employees and their families free of cost uh, you know, throughout the year. In fact, our one to one program has been around for quite a few years. We also conduct webinars and sessions on various uh, topics like parenting, self-development, uh, creating positive networks, um, all, all of which which are uh, interest areas for our members because we find that that's the kind of stuff that they read when they go through the one-to-one -one help uh, site. Also, we are a fairly young organization in terms of age, so we have a lot of young parents within the organization. Um, in our endeavor to uh, bring in more mindfulness in the organization, apart from the couple of programs that I talked about earlier, we're also doing sessions where we're teaching people uh, where we have instructors coming in and teaching people on how to uh, practice mindfulness. And our financial wellness series uh, uh, includes a lot of video-based learning, small capsule bite-sized learning, which we put on Workplace, which is accessible to everybody uh, so that they can learn how to, you know, uh, manage their financial well-being and be financially stable uh, to protect themselves and to take care of their families and to create wealth for themselves. The community uh, aspect um, happens through various programs within the organization. One of our flagship programs is uh, the program uh, run by uh, Marico Mentor Program, which we do in association with Marico Innovation Foundation. So Marico Innovation Foundation, among other things, works with social entrepreneurs to help them scale up. And Marico members actually volunteer and come forward to help these organizations. Uh, what it does for the uh, uh, social entrepreneurs is it it uh, makes available expertise that they're looking at. And what it does for the members is it gives them a sense of fulfillment because they've had an opportunity to um, help a social cause, a cause that they are close to. It's also given them a very different perspective uh, because it's, it's working in another organization. Uh, we have uh, so far, I mean, 30, of my, 30 Marico mentors have helped different organizations over the last few years. Um, Nihar, uh, works on girl child education and uh, the brand team there actually is very energized and charged because there's a very strong purpose to what Nihar offers. And uh, we support girl child education through various means. Uh, uh, we have education videos, we have uh, call-in centers where people can dial in and learn English language. Um, and that's one of the ways that uh, you know, Nihar contributes to society and our members also contribute through the Nihar program. 
uh, Kalpa Vriksha is our initiative. So, you know, anybody who knows Marikol, anybody who knows uh, Parachute knows that coconut is a mainstay for us. And, uh, you know, our agri teams work very closely with the farmers and through the Kalpa Vriksha program, they actually help farmers enhance their yield uh, and uh, protect their crops so that it actually eventually benefits the farmers. Teach Little Minds is where members volunteer and they go to schools and teach children uh, on the aspects of quality and why quality is an important aspect. And this is a program that we run both in India, India and Bangladesh. And Safola, of course, uh, you know, all of you know, has been uh, focused on healthcare and heart care. And recently we worked with FASSI to uh, publish uh, books and run education programs in schools to educate children on how to eat uh, safe and nutritious food. And our members have participated in that. So that's kind of been our journey um, at, uh, you know, as an organization and our endeavor to make a great, to make Marico a great place to work. Uh, we've been participating in the, in the Great Place to Work study in 2005. And, uh, you know, progressively and gradually taking efforts to continue to improve upon the benchmarks that we set for ourselves or the ones that we get from Great Place to Work to eventually be one of the most respected and uh, sought after organizations uh, within India. Um, so it's been an interesting and an exciting journey for us. And uh, we've learned a lot along the way. It has helped us evaluate our practices, critically examine what works, what doesn't work. It has given us feedback uh, from our members to tell us, you know, what we're promising, how we're delivering on those promises. And it's helped us, uh, you know, action many things uh, and progress uh, on this journey. So uh, that's what I had to share. Uh, I hope you found it relevant and interesting. And uh, we look forward to your questions now. So thank you so much, Shruti, for uh, you know taking us through this impressive uh, story of Marico. And I would actually also like to congratulate you for really demonstrating Marico's value of transparency, right? Of just you know about openly talking about some of the people practices that exist at Marico. Uh, you know, for us at Great Place to Work, at, actually is really really encouraging to go through some of these practices that you know, the best workplaces have designed, implemented, and have seen success with the great practices, yeah. We now move really to the next section of our webinar, and that's really the question and answers. Thank you for also all the participants who have put up some interesting questions here. Uh, that's what we'll pick up one by one. Uh, we may not be able to do answer some of them uh, just due to, you know, how time progresses, we'll see, but we'll have to, of course, we'll try to answer as many as we uh, can. Yeah. Just before we move to that, though, Shruti, any advice for organizations, uh, leaders, managers, HR fraternity, who are planning to embark on this journey, right, of building great workplace experience for their employees? So anything that you would want to talk about uh, in that regard? Thanks, Neha. Uh, I'd say that, you know, first of all, start the journey if you're really committed to it, uh, because it takes effort to be on this journey. Uh, it takes effort of the entire organization, the leadership team, the HR, the employees, everybody. And uh, that's a very, very important commitment that you make uh, for yourself as far as the organization. Uh, the second thing is that, you know, one of the dilemmas I think a lot of organizations go through is, are we ready yet for that to participate? You know, do we have the practices and the programs? Um, start the journey, you know, do your first assessment and then figure out how much of the gap is really there. Um, and then you can decide whether you want to take a break for a couple of years, build on some of the feedback that you've given um, and then restart the journey. Or you want to, you know, the feedback kind of indicates to you that you're well on your way and it's, it's worth pursuing that journey right from the beginning. Also remember that when you do these studies, particularly, for example, in the Great Place to Work study, there is an employee survey. So whenever you do surveys, there is always an expectation from the employees that something will change. Um, so in that spirit, you do have to commit to make sure that changes happen. Uh, for us, the reason why we got on this journey was to kind of to, um, you know, a benchmark and to see, you know, whatever we are doing, 
does why we know we do our internal inciting studies as well to understand whether it resonates with our employees but it also gives us a sense check that are we doing uh, you know what makes sense for the general population uh, because some of these people who are outside will also become future employees for us um, it helps us uh, raise our standards uh, you know gradually and uh, basically it just uh, helps us validate you know what we are doing whether it's uh, whether it's the right thing to do um, so if that's your intention um, then uh, you know start the journey and wish you all the best of that sure <clears throat> Thank you, Shruti. So I'll go to the questions that we have now received from the participants. Uh, broadly, till now, and uh, you know, more and more participants are writing, but what we've heard till now or what we've seen people writing up are questions around you know, the performance management and the transparency of the system. So when you put up goals publicly of really the leadership level as well, how do people respond, react, how do they take that bit. Uh, yeah, so given there's stuff, some stuff around performance management, fairness, transparency, so maybe we can take that up first and then we'll go to the next ones. Yeah. Um, actually, for us, it's not a dilemma because, uh, you know, the performance management system for us is a business performance management system. It's not just an individual performance management system. So our annual operating plan, so our you know, we do our three-year business plan and from that it translates into our annual operating plan. And that annual operating plan then breaks it into goals for, you know, the top leadership team and the cascade within the organization. So for us, the belief is that if people need to know what is it that they need to strive for, it's important for them to know what the overall big picture is. And that's what the leadership, uh, you know, goal sheets demonstrate. It talks about what are the top areas that the leadership is focusing on at an organization level, as well as at a functional level. And once that understanding is there, it is much easier. It's easier for people to relate to, okay, so how does my role contribute to that? And hence, what is it that I need to focus on? In fact, in Marico, uh, the goal sheets are not really handed out it is actually proposed by the member again in the spirit of empowerment so it's very important for them to understand the big picture understand what the top team is rooting for and based on that propose how their role or their function can contribute to the overall business um, does it raise questions on whether something is achievable or not of course it does and i think those are great conversation points uh, to really understand why something could be achievable or not achievable or more importantly what can be done to achieve a particular uh, goal we also have you know in fact our performance management system is also quite interesting because the way we do our performance measures we have a range so there's a budget and an outstanding range for every goal that we have so we already set for ourselves what the thresholds are and what's going to be exceptional performance so it becomes really, really important for every person to understand the big picture and then understand how he or she can contribute to the organization. Thank you, Shruti. So the next question uh, really talks about saying how difficult was it to set the leadership focus on people over customer? And uh, you know, a couple of questions around this sentiment of saying how you get the leadership involved. Also saying what are some of the roadblocks that you faced in this journey? So maybe you could talk about the involvement commitment from leadership and any other roadblocks that you think Marico faced in the overall journey. So um, I don't think for us, it's people over customer. Um, I think we are a consumer products company. So consumers, of course, are very, very important for us. Um, in a way, I would say they are the ultimate. But the consumers will not experience what they, ha what they have to experience if we don't focus on the people. And for us, hence, both are very, very important constituencies, as are the others that I mentioned as part of our purpose, which is our shareholders, our business associates, and the society at large, and even the environment, which is now uh, part of that entire group that's there. Um, so I think uh, both are important constituencies. We do different things for different people, uh, uh, for consumers versus our members. But we're also very clear, and I think one of the things we talk about when we talk of our values is consumer-centric is, is one of the most important values for us. So when we do values education within the organization, uh, we emphasize on the fact that as members, you know, no matter which role you are in, particularly even if you're in a role which is not a consumer-facing role, 
uh, the focus and the choices that people have to make have to be on what's right for consumer because you have to ultimately deliver what's right to the consumer. So um, both are important. You just do different things uh, uh, for the different uh, segments that are there. In terms of roadblocks or challenges in our journey, uh, you know, obviously there are, uh, you know, different challenges uh, that we encounter. Uh, I, I would, however, say that from a leadership perspective, I think one is we're very clear in terms of why we do why we do or participate in studies like this. Like I mentioned earlier, our objective of participating in studies like this is to get a holistic review of our practices, uh, to get an outside in perspective of our practices, to get neutral feedback uh, from our employees about the practices that are there. And that's really the way we and even the leadership of the organization looks at studies like this. Um, the roadblocks could be more in terms of maybe some of the initiatives or interventions that we want to implement, or maybe the number of interventions that we want to implement. And hence, we do go through a prioritization process. And that's also where the leadership gives inputs if they think that there are too many that, uh, you know, that um, you know, one is attempting at. Um, and sometimes, yes, you know, not all initiatives may yield a desired result, but, uh, you know, it's a learning experience. So if that doesn't work, we definitely try some other things. Uh, but I think at a, at a philosophical level, uh, there is alignment within the organization in terms of why we participate in studies like this. Shruti, the next set of questions are really around saying, where is Medico on a scale or in spectrum, if we say on one side, you have command and control and on the other side of the spectrum, you really have trust and track, right? So where is Marico on that spectrum? One link to that also, you know, people have asked uh, saying, if the attendance is not getting tracked or if there is flexi timing, how do we manage that for different population sets? So do you mean that we can give flexi timing for let's say our workers as well? So what's, what's your, your response to that? So um, what I mentioned is that we do have flexi timing in our offices. Um, we can't have flex flexi timing in our factories uh, for the reasons of the fact that in a factory, there is a manufacturing process that happens. And for that process to work effectively, there is, there is a particular time when people need to come together. Um, and hence, we, be, we do this where we can do it, which is in our offices that are there. Um, our belief as an organization is that we hire adults. And by that belief, it is that if you had adults, we expect adults to be responsible, to know what they're expected to do. And hence, we don't want to put unnecessary monitoring and control. Um, does that mean that we don't have any deviations? We do. Um, and we check those deviations, uh, whether it's through feedback, through counseling, through action. But we also believe that just because there are a few deviations, we should not really, uh, you know, make it difficult for the rest of the employees. Because at the core, at the core, we believe that we trust the people that we hire, and obviously, trust is reciprocated. So when you trust, so trust begets trust, and I think uh, that's one of the things that's worked for us. Shruti, a lot of interest around some of the development initiatives and programs that you spoke about. Uh, people are interested to know a little bit more around the iLearn program that you have, the personal development program, reverse mentoring, uh, growth hacking team. So maybe if you could talk a little, a line or two each on, starting from iLearn, personal development, reverse mentoring, to your growth hacking team, and maybe we can keep the growth hacking team separately as well to respond. So, you know, like every organization um, experiments with different learning formats. And of course, e-learning has, uh, I would say, relatively recent as compared to maybe the traditional classroom learning that's there. So iLearn for us um, has started primarily as an e-learning platform. We're now taking it to other types of learning as well. Uh, the, the reason why we brought iLearn into the organization was one, we realize that our population is getting younger and the way the younger population likes to learn is 
different from maybe the slightly older population. We also know that this population likes choice. So they want to decide what they want to learn and we wanted to give that choice to them. They want flexibility. They want to decide when they want to learn and we wanted to give that as well. And time is a constraint in today's day and age. So, you know, the same learning, if it can be in a much more capsuled or accelerated format, then that uh, that lends itself to, uh, you know, uh, that it lends itself better in today's day and age. And those were the reasons that prompted us to look at iLearn and start iLearn. Um, the reason why I learn, like I said, a core, core cultural tenant for us is empowerment. So we want people to take responsibility for their learning. Uh, we want people to exercise their choice. We believe that our role as an organization is to provide them platforms, is to provide them environment, to provide them the support. But if the learner himself or herself is not interested or doesn't aspire to learn, no matter how, how many platforms you provide, you'll find that they will not really learn. So that's the way um, iLearn has come about. Um, this is, we, we've, we have two and a half years of e-learning. It's probably lesser than some of the organizations. Um, and it has required us to bring in a certain amount of rigor and follow up to ensure that people actually take up that learning. But I'm, I'm quite proud to say that, uh, you know, over the last two years, we've got almost 90 to 97, almost 95 to 97% completion rates in terms of learning. In the first year, our focus was only to get people to uh, experience the self-paced learning. But over the last year, we are now constituting learning journeys so that after the person goes through the learning, there is some post-learning action that, uh, that also happens so that the person is able to imbibe learning. Have we done it for all the programs that we offer? No, but that's definitely on the on the cards because that's the way we see the learning being embedded uh, within the organization. Um, having said that, as an organization, we are a still a very, very strong believer of experience being the best teacher. And that's really where the platforms like the Young Board and the Growth Hacking Teams help because those platforms put people in life situations where they have to deal with business problems or business opportunities, create a business out of something. Um, and, you know, that learning we find is uh, much better embodied. Um, and hence those platforms, um, you know, are, are something that we have uh, within the organization. Sure. Uh so the thought that's really uh, going through Shruti is, uh, you know, people are talking about saying uh, we also have the intent to do something like this. And uh, of course, really, really encouraging. Uh, they're also sure it gives results to Marico. What people really want to know is what are the budget implications for uh, initiating the great place to work journey, right? Uh, so saying, uh, has Marico spent internally a lot of money in putting in place some of these programs? Do you have a set budget that you keep aside for these initiatives, programs? And how do you uh, kind of deal with that? So we don't put budgets just because there's some feedback that's coming out of studies like this. We put budgets when we say, okay, this is the feedback that's coming out of it. Uh, this is what our members are saying. This is what our strategic plan for HR or talent is or for the organization is. And that really drives our budget decisions. Have we spent a lot of money on these initiatives? Um, I won't say that, you know, it's, it's enormous. We are fairly thrifty as an organization. Uh, but where we need to spend money, uh, we have spent money. So for example, iLearn is um, the entire e-learning aspect was not something that was there as, as part of the organization. And obviously that required a certain kind of resourcing and funds that were needed to be done. So once the organization decided that we wanted to take, we definitely, you know, budgeted for that and took that on. But things like the Young Board and Growth Hacking, it, they're not really about funding. They're a lot more about experiences and how do you manage those experiences? And you might need some funding to give people some exposure or maybe some formal inputs, but inherently platforms like these are, uh, are not a lot about money. Or even if you look at the policies, which are on my day, I mean, it really doesn't, Actually, it doesn't cost you anything. You're probably productivity wise, you're probably going to gain something out of it uh, rather than having to spend. So um, you don't it's you don't necessarily have to spend big bucks. You have to understand what the community is telling you in terms of feedback and make choices 
which makes sense for you as an organization. Um, and uh, you know, if you if you rigorously implement that, uh, they will deliver the goods for you. Sure. Uh kind of linked to this and also the earlier aspect where you Shruti spoke about uh, you know the development programs people want to know how do you count the return on investment of the various learning development initiatives so is there a measure that you uh, kind of have put in place and how do you talk about or measure those, those benefits, benefits? Um, so we, uh, like every organization, we do have some standard metrics that we look at whenever we do a learning intervention or a training program. But more and more, what we are shifting towards is looking at impact measures. So really, uh, the key measures that we've started looking at now as an organization is, one is, is there a shift in the capability of the person after the person has gone through the learning interventions? Mm -hmm. um, and for certain levels within the organization, we have a detailed competency uh, discussion process, uh, where as part of that process, we actually track shifts uh, that have happened for the person. Um, the other measures that we look at is uh, what is the depth of talent that we have uh, across different levels in the organization? Because that also gives us an indication is what is the level of readiness that we have within the organization. So um, I'd say we're also moving or traversing that journey where we are going from the standard conventional measures of learning hours and participation and coverage. Uh, which we do track uh, to more impact measures, which are looking at depth of talent and uh, you know shifts in capabilities, because those are more business linked measures. Sure, uh, I think one aspect which we have not spoken about is saying uh, the new recruits, right? Uh, so how do you ensure quality of talent that you get on board? Also, uh, how do you align those people to your value system? Thanks, Neha. Uh, so, uh, we have a fairly well-established recruitment process within the organization. And the filters that we look at within the when we hire somebody is, first of all, we don't hire people just for the current role. We hire people who we believe can grow within the organization, can at least do two or three more roles within the organization. So that actually is our first selection criteria. Um, the second thing is that we obviously, uh, we also use certain uh, assessment tools as part of our recruitment uh, process. We are a believer in the strengths philosophy. And that's uh, one of the things that we check for uh, as part of our uh, recruitment process. Uh, for senior leaders, we also try and understand what are their deeper life interests. And what is going to be, because remember, you know, our talent value proposition is enrich and fulfill. So what is it that people are going to find fulfilling? Um, and that's something that we also check for. Culture alignment is another big thing that we check for because, uh, you know, one of the things about having a very strong culture in is that uh, fitment becomes important. And we find uh, if people don't fit, you know, they, you know, the system kind of just highlights that very, very easily. And the person also uh, you know, understands that. So for us, culture alignment is a big part of uh, the check that we do. And we have various levels in the recruitment process. We have four levels. So different levels check for different things. There are certain levels which will check for competence. There are certain levels that will check for fitment and alignment. So that's part of the process design. Once the person has come on board, one is the immediate onboarding where, you know, they get to know the function, the business, um, a little bit about the organization processes. Um, but all particularly what we call managers and partners, partners is the leadership brand in Maribel. All of them go through a three day uh, induction program, which is in fact, it's called the HR process orientation program. And it's not just a generic induction. And um, the reason we call it HR process orientation is because we believe that people are a line leader's responsibility. So we need to equip people to manage their teams. And so over the three days, they actually go through a very, very detailed induction uh, where they, uh, we, we spent almost three fourths of a day to understand the Marico values journey uh, through the history. And it's, it's a very interesting, uh, you know, interactive session that we do, uh, which is in a storytelling format. And everybody participates in that session to really help them understand A, why Marico is the way it is, 
what are the beliefs so some of the things that i talked about earlier in the presentation is what we talked through the story and also make them understand what are the current values and how do those values how are the va those values actually delivered for for marico right so that's that's the thing that they go through and apart from that they go through very very detailed uh, uh, sessions through case studies on the various processes which is, whether it's a performance management process whether it's a development uh process uh, whether it's a recognition process and the reason it's a case study based format is because we want people to learn to apply them and not just know them conceptually um so it's very interesting uh, a lot of the new joinees when they get an invitation for this 3 day program they wonder what is it that they want to be doing for 3 days and after 3 days uh, they are also grateful for the fact that they've actually spent those 3 days and uh, Uh, they said, you know, those have been the most valuable three days that uh, they've had uh, since they've joined the organization. Um, so these are some of the things that we do uh, as an organization, and we also have Amber, who's our digital assistant, and she keeps a check and seeks feedback from them in terms of what's been their onboarding experience. So thank you, Shruti, and thanks to all of our participants for making this. Uh, more interactive and kind of uh, just increasing the amount of sharing that we could possibly do from our side asking all the questions and shruti thanks for picking those up for us i know there are a couple of questions which we also couldn't answer today you know because we are kind of already now running against time what we are going to do is from great place to work we are going to share with you this presentation and also the recording of our webinar today we'll also share back answers to some of your questions that you have keyed in which we could not pick up during the session yeah just a last one thing there is a poll feedback poll option that's available on the webinar would request all of you to share the same with us thank you for joining thank you neha and the great place to work team and thank you everybody for joining for the webinar to your